In 1990, at a cosmology conference, American science journalist John Horgan asked a bunch of attendees to nominate the smartest living physicist. The attendees included people like Stephen Hawking, Nobel laureate Jim Peebles, Helen Guth, and Andre Linde, who are very well respected cosmologists. The winner of this poll was a physicist named Edward Witten, and some people even considered him to be in the same league as Einstein and Newton. On top of that, in popular media, we hear claims like this about him Ed Witten is a very special person in the field. He clearly has a grasp, particularly of the underlying mathematical principles, which is far greater than most other people. Uh, one single individual who is the most dominant mind on planet Earth at the moment. Well, you know, we all think we're very smart, and he's so much smarter than the rest of us. So who is this physicist, and what work did he do to receive this kind of praise from physicists? I am a theoretical physicist, and in this video, we will answer this question. Some parts of this video can be a bit technical, but I will try to simplify things as much as I can. Yeah, just so it's clear, if, if like, most of us are here, Ed is up here. But I think it's such a natural consequence of a theory that is only unified in higher dimensions. The couplings of the gluon to itself involve commutators of generators of Lie algebra. Uh, I'm more worried about not being able to understand properly the things that aren't too abstract. <laughs> <laughs> Edward Britton was born on 26th of August 1951 in Baltimore, Maryland. His grandparents came from Eastern Europe and his parents were from Baltimore, Maryland. His father, Louis Witten, is also a theoretical physicist who mainly worked in gravitational physics. Witten grew up in a neighborhood called Summit Park in Pikesville, Baltimore. He attended a school named Park School. In his childhood years, it was the era of the space race and hence, he was interested in astronomy. He also showed promise in mathematical abilities as he learned basic calculus when he was 11. I had no idea of the beauty and depth of mathematics until I was exposed to calculus at age 11. He then attended Brandeis University where he majored in history with a minor in linguistics. My degree is in history, it's factually correct, but at my university, to have a degree that was labeled a history degree required a very modest number of history courses. So what I actually had was a wide smattering of all kinds of courses. Actually, the subject I was most intensely interested in as an undergraduate, at least for a while, was linguistics. Later, in an interview, when he was asked that why he chose to do a bachelor's in history, he said that sometimes the choices made by young people are inscrutable. After his bachelor's degree, he dabbled in different professions to figure out the profession that suited him best. For some time, he wanted to be a journalist and even wrote some articles. For example, this article in the News Republic titled, Are You Listening, D.H. Lawrence? In 1972, he also worked for George McCurvin's primary presidential campaign in Massachusetts, but later realized that this wasn't for him. On top of that, he attended University of Michigan as an economics graduate student but dropped out after one semester. He then started as a graduate student of applied mathematics at Princeton University but at the end of the first year there he switched to theoretical physics and started his PhD under David Cross. At that time, David Cross published his paper with his student Frank Wilczek which established the fact that the force between the elementary particles called quarks decreases in strength as they come closer and closer. This phenomenon is called asymptotic freedom and for this discovery, David Cross was awarded the 2004 Nobel Prize in Physics along with his student Frank Wilczek and another physicist named Hugh Pulitzer who did similar work to Gross and Wilczek. Did you expect um, this one? Uh, to some extent. <laughs> Witten did quite a lot of studies in his PhD years to learn what a physics PhD is supposed to know. In an interview, he says that he learned general relativity in a very exciting period of 10 days from Steven Weinberg's book. He also did calculations that are relevant for probing particles like protons and neutrons. These calculations are called deep inelastic scattering calculations. A calculation that he did was a deep inelastic calculation involving scattering between two photons, but the experiments were not up to the mark to test this calculation at that time. This test was conducted later. In his PhD years, his advisor David Gross showed him a recently published paper by a physicist named Gerard T. Hooft. In this paper, Tuft established a connection between string theory and a special kind of theory called large and gauge theory. In an interview, Witten remarks that this paper was one of his earliest interactions with string theory. Witten completed his PhD in June 1976. His graduate committee included physicists like Sam Treeman and possibly Anthony Z. I say possibly because Witten said that Anthony Z was either in his thesis committee or in his generals committee. Witten wrote his thesis titled Some Problems in the Short Distance Analysis of Gauge Theories, which included three of his papers 
papers on various topics in gauge theories. However, his best works were yet to come. After his PhD, Steven Weinberg offered him a postdoc position at Harvard University and Witten accepted the offer. The visit to Harvard allowed him to interact with very respectable physicists like Steven Weinberg, Sidney Coleman, Sheldon Glashow, and Howard Georgi. In 1977, Witten also got a fellowship at Harvard and there is an interesting story about this. For his fellowship, his PhD advisor David Gross wrote a recommendation letter and it was a one-line recommendation letter that said he is smarter than me and probably smarter than you, so accept him. In a later interview, David Cross confirmed the story. I think I remember you famously, and I think this is true, and I can't help but say this story because it relates to the Society of Fellows where both you and I and Ed was a member, is, is I think you wrote to them uh, a, a single line recommendation, didn't you? Say something like, this guy is smarter than me and he's smarter than you. <laughs> Take him. Is that true? It, it's true. <laughs> in 1977, he was invited by the famous mathematician Michael Atiyah to visit Oxford and this became one of his many visits to Oxford. His collaboration with Michael Atiyah would later become very fruitful which will contribute to his Fields Medal Award. During his Harvard years, he got offers from various universities including Caltech, Berkeley and the Institute of Advanced Study at Princeton. He accepted the offer at Princeton and became a faculty member there. There, he supervised various PhD students who went on to become big names in the field, including John Beggar, Kumron Rafa, Eva Silverstein, Shubit Kachru, and Sergei Kukov. In 1977, when Witten went to Oxford, Michael Atiyah showed him a paper that was written by Klaus Monton and, and David Olive. In this paper, they conjectured that in some quantum field theories, the roles of messenger particles called gauge bosons and magnetic monopoles will be switched if the strength of the interaction is increased. The technical jargon for increasing force is going from weak coupling to strong coupling. Now, at weak coupling, gauge bosons were particles, but magnetic monopoles were not particles, but something that was distributed over a large region. This conjecture provided a connection between physics at weak coupling and strong coupling, and this connection is called S-duality. After seeing that paper, Witten met David Olive and they wrote a paper in which they refined this conjecture. However, Witten thought that they had explained the formulas of Olive and Montonen without using S-duality. However, we will later see in the story that this conclusion was wrong. Meanwhile, in 1979, Michael Atiyah and another mathematician named Raoul Boat were trying to teach physicists about an area of mathematics called Morse theory. In simple terms, Morse theory tries to study how a space looks like as a whole, which is referred to its topology by studying functions on this space which we can take the derivative of. These functions are known as differentiable functions. Later, when Witten was at Princeton, he was thinking about a problem regarding how supersymmetry breaks spontaneously. This means that the theory is still supersymmetric, but the lowest energy state of the theory is not supersymmetric. Witten was looking at simpler and simpler models and he saw that even for the simplest models, the way in which supersymmetry broke was very weird. He wanted to explain why this behavior is strange. One day, as he recalls, he was in a swimming pool at Aspen, Colorado, when he had the epiphany that he could explain this weird behavior using the same Morse theory that Atiyah and Bot were trying to teach. So he wrote this paper named Supersymmetry and Morse Theory in 1980 and it got a lot of attention because it was interesting for both physicists and mathematicians. This work would later contribute to earning him a Fields Medal. After that, in 1982, Witten spent a summer reading a review article by John Schwartz on superstring theory. John Schwartz was one of the pioneers of string theory. However, Witten was hesitant to get involved in superstring theory because he thought that it was a long-term project. In hindsight, he was right. At that time, there were three known superstring theories which are type 1, type 2a, and type 2b. These theories could have inconsistencies in them which are known as anomalies. It turned out that it was easy to see that the type 2a theory does not have anomalies. Moreover, Witten with another physicist named Alvarez Combe showed that type 2b is free of anomalies as well. However, type 1 could have anomalies. This job was undertaken by John Schwartz and Michael Green and they showed in August 1984 that type 1 was free of anomalies as well, but only when the theory has a particular gauge group. That gauge group was SO32. This calculation was so important that this sparked a revolution in physics called the first superstring revolution, although Witten thinks that it should be called the second superstring revolution, with the first revolution being around the 1970s. After this triumph, Witten became actively involved in superstring theory. In 1987, he also co-authored a two-volume book on superstring theory with Michael Green and John Schwartz that became the first ever textbook on superstring theory. It is still a very good book to learn about many topics in string theory. Another problem on which Witten worked 
work that later contributed to earning him a Fields Medal is about gravity. People were trying to prove that if there is an isolated system, then the energy of that system that comes due to gravity, which is also referred to as its gravitational energy, is never negative. The technical jargon for this energy is ADM mass. It can be positive or it can be zero, but it's zero only if there is nothing to produce the gravitational energy. This statement is called the positive energy theorem and mathematicians were trying to prove this statement for quite a while. In 1979 and 1981, mathematicians Ching Tung Yao and Richard Schoen produced papers that proved this result. However, these proofs were too opaque for an average physicist. Witten recalls that even he didn't understand the proof at that time. So he tried to write his own proof. His way was paved by a 1977 paper by physicists Stanley Dizer and Claudio Titelboim when they proved that the positive energy theorem is true but for supergravity. Supergravity is actually a supersymmetric theory where we can do different supersymmetric transformations at different points of space-time. Now, to derive the same result for Einstein's general relativity, one has to see the result in the regime of classical physics. So, one has to take the classical limit. Dizer and Tittleboim claimed that you can't take this limit. However, Witten didn't agree with them and he was able to take the limit and prove the positive energy theorem for general relativity. Moreover, he also wrote another paper where he showed that there are some theories with small compactified dimensions where the positive energy theorem doesn't hold. These theories are called kaluza klein theories. He also showed that if you include matter particles in these theories, which are also called fermions, then the positive energy theorem will be true again. There is a third problem that contributed to his Fields Medal. When Witten visited Oxford, Michael Lathier told him about a quantity called Jones polynomial. Jones polynomial is one among the various quantities which are referred to as the knot invariants. These knot invariants are used to differentiate inequivalent knots from each other. Michael Lathier thought that there could be an understanding of the Jones polynomial from a physics perspective. Witten started to think about it and to cut the story short, when he was sitting in a talk at Swansea University, he realized that there is a three-dimensional theory called the Chern-Simons theory which can be used to understand the Jones polynomial. He published his findings in 1989. Witten was awarded the Fields Medal in 1990. During Witten's visit to Oxford, Michael Lathia also told him about a program in mathematics called Langlands program. This program relates different areas of mathematics with each other. Witten started to work on developing an analogy between Langlands program and special kinds of theories in physics called conformal field theories. However, in 1991, Bellingson and Rinfield published their work and after the publication of this work, Witten stopped doing this work because, as he recalls, he thought that the analogy that he was drawing was too superficial. In the work of Bellingson and Rinfield, they used a concept called geometric Heck transformations. Witten wanted to understand this in the context of physics, but it was giving him a hard time. We will return to this story later to talk about how Witten solved this problem. As I mentioned before, when Witten wrote a paper with David Olive, he thought that they had explained the formulas without using S-duality. The reason is that Witten was very skeptical about the existence of such dualities between strong coupling and weak coupling behavior. However, in the early 90s, his views started to change. In the 1980s, people like Michael Duff and Paul Townsend were working on a membrane theory which said that there could be a theory of fundamental membranes like fundamental strings. However, these theories lacked some of the very attractive features that string theory has. Later, people started to consider that these membrane-like things might be found within string theory. One paper that was important in this era was the paper by Curtis Kalan, Jeffrey Harvey, and Andrew Strominger. But the most important paper that changed Witten's attitude towards dualities came from somewhere else. In 1993, John Schwartz and Ashok Sen wrote a paper that showed that a particular string theory called heterotic string theory, when viewed in four dimensions by making the other dimension small, exhibits properties of s dual this duality implied that there should exist a state in which two magnetic monopoles are bound to each other, but there was no evidence that such a two-monopole bound state can exist or not. This changed in 1994 when Ashok Sen proved that these bound states exist. Witten recalls that this paper by Ashok Sen really convinced him that this duality has to be right. This paper by Sen also in part inspired the work that Witten did with another physicist named Nathan Seiberg some months later, which is now called cyberg witten duality. In this work, they used a particular duality to guess the form of a particular supersymmetric theory at low energies. Later, they did another piece of work in which they talked about a supersymmetric version of the theory of strong interactions, which is also called QCD. Now, QCD is the theory that describes the physics inside a nucleus. And an unsolved problem in this theory is to predict that we can never see an individual quark. This problem is called quark confinement. Cyborg and Britain were able to show that quark confinement 
does happen in the supersymmetric version of QCD. At this time, there were five different versions of string theory. We have already mentioned three before, and there were two more versions of string theory that were discovered later. These versions are called heterotic SO32 and heterotic E8 times E8. Britton was trying to show that some of these string theories may be eliminated, so he tried to show that type 2A theory may have contradictions when we go to the strong coupling limit. However, when he was on a flight coming back from Canada, he realized that there was no inconsistency there and the strong coupling limit introduced an extra dimension into the theory. Now, getting this extra 11th dimension was not a new idea as this 11th dimension had appeared before, for example in the work of Paul Townsend. However, what Witten did was that he checked that when the coupling is weak, this dimension is small and vice versa. This work led to his famous 1995 paper and his talk where he conjectured that all five string theories are just different limits of the same theory named M-theory. Today, we know that there is a well-established web of dualities that connect string theories to each other and to M-theory. This work started the era which is referred to as the second superstring revolution. Later, Witten wrote a paper with Kumbrun Rafa to test the exact test of olive Montonin's duality at the strong coupling and for many people, this was the paper that was most convincing evidence for S-duality. Before the century ended, Witten wrote two more influential papers. In 1998, a physicist named Juan Maldacena wrote this paper where he showed that certain gravitational theories in a particular kind of space-time named ADS space-time can be described in terms of non-gravitational theories on the boundary of these space-times. These non-gravitational theories were conformal field theories or CFT for short. Therefore, this correspondence was called ADS-CFT correspondence. After this paper, Witten wrote a paper that made this correspondence more precise and worked out some methods to calculate certain quantities for CFTs on the boundary using the ADS space-time. These methods included diagrams and therefore these diagrams are now known as Witten diagrams. Another paper that Witten wrote before the end of the century was with Nathan Seiberg. There are some indications in string theory that indicate that the coordinates of the space-time might not commute with one another. It means that you can take the coordinates of two points and multiply them and the answer depends on the order in which these are multiplied. These space-times are called non-commutative space-times. This non-commutativity was hard to understand. However, mathematician Elaine Cohns and physicists Michael Douglas and Albert Schwartz wrote a paper in 1997 where they tried to make sense of this non-commutativity but only in a particular limit. Another seminal paper in making sense of this was by Albert Schwartz and Nikita Nekrasov. These papers motivated Witten and Cyberg to write this paper in 1998 where they gave new perspectives on the earlier papers and tried to get results without applying the limit that the earlier papers were applying. This paper became a major paper when it comes to non-commutativity in string theory. Now let's come back to the story where Witten was working on geometric Langlands and struggling with interpreting the concept of geometric hack transformations. In 2003, a conference was arranged at Institute of Advanced Study, Princeton, where mathematicians tried to teach physicists about the Langlands program. At this conference, David Benzui gave a talk where he talked about a physical system which was a two-dimensional field theory and he claimed that this is approximate geometric Langlands. Britain realized that this is an approximation only because we are seeing it in the wrong picture and if we see it in the right picture, this won't be an approximation anymore but the exact geometric Langlands. The technical jargon for this picture is complex structure. However, Britain was still struggling with the problem of interpreting heck transformations in the context of physics. On one day, on a flight that he took from Seattle, he had this epiphany that geometric heck transformations correspond to what physicists call the Tuft operator. Tuft operators are found in gauge theories and they can be thought of as a line on which magnetic charge is distributed. After this realization, Witten collaborated with physicist Anton Kapustin, who already had done some work in this area, and produced a long paper that was more than 200 pages long. In this paper, they described geometric Langlands in terms of a modified version of a supersymmetric gauge theory. There are many other works of Witten that we can talk about, but I will just mention some of them briefly. With Peter Horawa, Witten established a duality between M-theory and heterotic string theory. This result is called the Horawa-Witten theory. With physicists Julius Wetz and Bruno Zomino, he developed the concept of special types of CFTs. These CFTs are called wetz zomino witten models or WZW models. These models have lots of applications in studying CFTs. There is something that we call open string field theory and the simplest example of open string field theory was provided by Witten in 1991. There is a quantity called Covenov homology which is again related to knots. Just like Witten had established the relation between Jones polynomial and gauge theory, he 
was successful in establishing the relation between Cauvin of homology and gauge theory as well. Britain showed that magnetic monopoles should have an electrical charge that depends on its magnetic charge and another quantity that depends on the theory. This quantity is called the theta angle of the theory and this result is known as the Witten effect. The membranes on which the endpoints of the strings live are called D-brains. Based on some earlier results, he showed that the charge on D-brains should be classified by a mathematical theory. This mathematical theory is known as K-theory. In the end, I would just say that I have huge respect for Dr. Witten and his work. Moreover, he has inspired me and I'm sure many others to pursue theoretical physics. If you have any questions or comments about this video, let me know in the comments and I will see you in the next video.